Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. to another episode of the Wisconsin DNR Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. So as a quick reminder, this really gives us an opportunity as DNR staff to give you, as the public and the listener, an opportunity to really get an inside look at what we do at the department, whether it's in the field or in the office, and how it all hits home for you, what it all means for you, whether you spend time on the water, time hunting, time hiking, or just have a love for the outdoors. So we're hoping we're giving you some some interesting perspective here. We've got a really good one for today with some fisheries staff. So um, today we're going to be covering panfish biology and management in Wisconsin. Obviously, panfish is like Packers, cheese, fish fry. It's up there. So very popular topic here. So I think this is going to be a good one. So we've got Zach Feiner, who is a DNR fisheries research scientist. Max Walter, who is a DNR fisheries biologist for Sawyer County and Alex Latska, who is a fisheries systems biologist. You're going to have to explain that because I have no idea what that means. But, I can do that. So we'll start with Zach here. Um, i just like to get a little background um, from the people on the show. So how does it all, how does it all hit home from you? Maybe history, fishing, or, or what is your interest in, in, in fish in general? Sure. I mean, I grew up fishing. I'm a Wisconsin kid, so I grew up in southern Wisconsin, and I pretty much lived on the Wisconsin River growing up. So I spent all of my time fishing for walleye, going out to the lakes, fishing for panfish, um, and that's really where it all started for me, is growing up fishing, and I decided to find a way to make fish my career. So now I'm able to do research and help out folks and think about ways to, different ways to manage fish populations and understand how they're going to react to um, how we fish them. So fisheries research scientists, so can you maybe explain for the listener who might not be familiar, can you give kind of the nutshell of, of what your job looks like, if, sure. if you can? <laughs> it's way more computer time than you probably think, but the uh, what I do is uh, take research ideas and um, research objectives that managers want answered. So they want to know you know, how are fish populations trending in Wisconsin? How are fish populations might respond to different ma management regulations? And I can take data and do some analysis and come up with answers to those questions. And then I can find ways to bring those back to managers and give them suggestions for, or let them work with them to come up with suggestions for how to um, change regulations, for example, or how, what to expect in the future when it comes to how our fish populations might look. And that's a really good example of what I mentioned earlier. I mentioned work in the field and in the office because the work that Zach does is incredibly important, and I think we're going to hear more about that as we get going, but that's just a really good example of um, not every fishery staff is a biologist or vice versa. There are people in the field, there are people in the office, so I think that really brings some good perspective. Alex, how about you? Yeah, so my background also uh, heavily into fish. I actually grew up in Massachusetts, but my mom is from De Pere, my dad's from Minnesota, so a lot of roots in the Midwest. Um, most of that fishing was in, in Leech Lake in Minnesota, kind of grew up there, that's where I got into it. Started with perch fishing, and then kind of worked my way up the food web up to, at least in that system, it was all pike fishing. And then I kind of transferred that back home to Massachusetts, a lot of bass fishing, other pan fishing. Um, and just like Zach, I kind of wanted to make fish my career, so got into natural resources, conservation sorts of ideas, and then into fisheries management. Um, and I do have a, just like Zach, have a background in research, and I still use that in a lot of my work today. Um, so the job, uh, you mentioned fishery systems biologist, what does that actually mean? Uh, I, I'm going to bet that your job is so much cooler than it sounds as fisheries systems biologist. I feel like they're being unfair to you by naming it that. Well, I'll leave you to be the judge of how cool it is, but um, it's, it's a new position um, and it's sort of uh, an intermediary between someone like Zach and someone like Max, who you'll hear from in a second. Um, part of my job is being a liaison between our research bureau and our researchers and our managers, so it's a, a lot of it will be helping 
um, make sure that the newest research, newest available data and science we're using in the best ways that we can on the management front. Um, and then that also ties into how we monitor fisheries. We, we do a lot of monitoring of our fisheries in the field um, that's not just geared towards research, research. It's trying to take the pulse of the population, figure out um, what's trending in different ways and how we can manage against those trends. Um, so uh, half of my job is, is on this monitoring front and making sure that we're monitoring lakes and rivers across the state appropriately given our, kind of our major concerns at that time. Max, how about you? Yeah, so I'm Max Wolter. I am the fisheries biologist up in Hayward. So I'm the manager that Zach was talking about doing the research for. So I benefit from having eggheads like Zach and Alex um, doing a lot of the hardcore data work and uh, setting us up to hopefully make good decisions in the field, uh, whether that's setting regulations or determining where we need to stock. That's kind of more my job. So I have set of lakes up in Hayward um, that we manage and we manage for a whole bunch of different species up there which is a lot of fun. I love working with muskies and I really love working with panfish too which is kind of what led me to being on the panfish management team uh, which Zach and Alex are as well. Um, I grew up in Chippewa Falls so I'm a Wisconsin kid and I was really excited to have an opportunity to come work for the Wisconsin DNR on some of the lakes that I fished uh, as a young person so um, yeah it's it's a uh, it's a, it's, my job is as fun as it sounds like it is. As a f field fisheries biologist, I get to be out there and, and see some really cool stuff. But I think it's perfect for the podcast because it sounds like we have a wide range of duties, so I think that'll be really, really interesting for the discussion. So I guess without further ado, we'll get cooking here. What do we consider to be a panfish? Panfish probably means a whole bunch of different things to different people, but is there a way that you guys can kind of describe what is a panfish? Yeah, that is a great question because if you ask 10 different people from Wisconsin, you know, what constitutes a panfish, you would probably get 10 different answers. And there is an official answer. Um, but the two things panfish have in common is, is, first off, their size, and that's how they got the name panfish. They're all relatively small species of fish. Uh, and the other thing that is they have in common is they're very edible, and people value them as a, as a harvest-oriented species. So um, primarily our big three are bluegill, black crappie and yellow perch, but then you've got all these other fun ones that some people don't even know about and can't even ID, and you guys might have to help me out with remembering all of them. we got white crappie, we have orange spotted sunfish, green sunfish, we might have red ear in some parts of the southern part of the state. Pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seed. Is there a bass that's considered a panfish? Is there like a rock bass or something? No. Interestingly enough, in Wisconsin, rock bass are not an official panfish, despite being about the same size. And looking like everything else in that family, um, rock bass are their own separate thing. So there is some confusion surrounding this, but, but generally when we're talking about panfish, what anglers are out there catching is bluegill, crappie, and perch. So for the classification, it sounds like, is it more of like an anecdotal, yeah, it's, it's all these things in a general sense more than a biological sense when we say panfish, so... Okay. Yeah, I would say so. Everyone's yeah. not. Like, Everyone's not. <laughs> yeah, because even within panfish, I mean, a perch is considered a panfish, and a perch is much more closely related to a walleye than it is to a bluegill or a crappie or the rest of its, you know, panfish brethren. So um, it's a group that we've kind of arbitrarily decided, and I think most of it has to do with the size of the fish. That's that's my perception anyway. But that goes way back many many years. And because of the size of the fish, they're kind of treated by the anglers the same way. They, they can catch a lot of them, they can eat a lot of them, so we manage them in similar ways. Well, whoever chose the name did a good job. I think it's safe to say that it's stuck. So I think it's pretty <laughs> ingrained in Wisconsin's culture, which is a perfect segue to why do people love panfish? What is it about it? Is there a social aspect, the fishing aspect? I would say because they're delicious would be one pretty large part of it. Uh, I love panfish, I love bluegill. That's one of my favorite fish to eat. Um, I think another aspect of why people enjoy panfish is because they can be fairly abundant and they are a very accessible fishery to a lot of people. A lot of people's first fish is a bluegill, you know, off the shore, off the pier, or something like that. So um, they make a really great kind of entry fishery. They can be aggressive. You can go out and catch a whole bunch of them, like Alex said, and make a meal out of them. And I think it makes them very popular. Do you guys want to add to that? That was a pretty good answer. It was a good answer. <laughs> yeah, Thank I'll you. just elaborate, I think. Um, part of what makes them so accessible, you don't need a boat, you don't need fancy equipment, you don't need a fancy electronics most of the time, although we talked about this earlier, they're kind of a increasingly used. 
Um, you can walk to any shore and pro- throw out a bobber and probably catch a panfish. You know, they're, and they're, they tend to be everywhere, and they're not too hard to find. And the season's open year-round, which contributes to that, too. You never have to worry about opening dates or anything like that. You can go pan fishing 365. Yeah, I think the accessibility accessibility thing for me is, is really big because I think it's a great way, like you guys mentioned, to get people into fishing. And then obviously Friday night fish fry. Like It doesn't get any better than that. Um, Zach, I think you had mentioned you had lived outside of Wisconsin. So mm-hmm. is the panfish culture different? Is the fish fry culture different? Uh, so there's really... The fish fry culture is a Wisconsin thing. I mean, so I've lived in Arizona, I've lived in North Carolina, I've lived in Indiana. You don't find the kind of Friday night fish fry as a tradition anywhere else in Wisconsin. It's kind of its own thing. You go there, you get your brandy old fashioned and your your fish fry, and it's um, it's kind of a Wisconsin uh, original thing. But the panfish, uh, fishing is really, I think, kind of common to all states everywhere you go people like to fish for perch or they like to fish for different kinds of sunfish you have different species in different states and they might have different common names like we were talking that you might get shell crackers and brim instead of red ear sunfish and bluegill down south um but uh people love to fish for them everywhere they're like we said they're super accessible you can go anywhere and probably catch a panfish if you want to so we got the easy questions out of the way those were the softballs i'm just tricking you guys into being on this podcast but (laughs) So what makes panfish management different from other species? Because you guys have mentioned that they're kind of everywhere and they're kind of so prolific in these systems. Is there something that makes managing the species different than, say, like a muskie or a walleye? Well, I think the key difference has to do with that. It has to do with the numbers. So there's you know, far, population-wise, there's far more bluegill or perch in a system than there are walleye and than muskie, certainly. Um, so that allows for there to be a lot more harvest, a lot, a lot higher catch rates. People catch a lot more of them. People eat a lot more of them, and the population generally can take that. It can, it's resili- resilient to that sort of harvest, whereas that might not be the case for all populations of walleye or muskie or any of those higher trophic level fisheries. So, so that's the the key difference in management, or the one that's really obvious if you look at regulations. The the bag limits are twenty five or ten instead of one or three or five. Mm-hmm. One of the other really fundamental differences with managing panfish compared to a walleye or muskie is with walleye and muskie we're always struggling to get enough of them out there you know we want to make sure they're recruiting and and having a good year class you'll hear that all the time with walleye we want to have a good year class so we put a lot of them out there with panfish it's actually the opposite you're trying to limit their recruitment which is the number of new fish coming into the lake every year that have, have been born you know reproduced um, because when they get super abundant they don't grow very fast. And that's a problem that's fairly unique to panfish in Wisconsin. You're actually trying to limit the number of, of new fish coming into the system every year as opposed to with muskies and walleye where you're trying to maximize it. Can a lot of panfish in a system too affect the other species? Can they have negative effects there? Or is it just kind of only limiting themselves and their size? Uh, mostly themselves. You know, if you have a really abundant panfish population, um, they're going to serve as prey for other other species, and maybe it would create a bottleneck for something else. But but typically they're they're hurting themselves more than anything else. I think that's been our most common observation. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think when you think about kind of these overabundant panfish populations, you think about lots of small fish, and they're kind of limiting themselves, um, whereas they might serve as a really great forage base for predators, and they can have uh, impacts kind of down the food web, which is some interesting stuff. So they might eat a lot of plankton that eat algae. So if they eat all the plankton, you might get actually more algae because you you don't have all these plankton around to eat the algae. So you can have kind of these different effects on lower parts of the food web. But when you think about your game fish, I don't know that they are too sensitive to differences Mm -hmm. in panfish. And you mentioned too that kind of keeping an eye on the populations in these systems and trying to keep them under control. How do you guys keep an eye on the number like obviously you're not counting going out and counting everyone but are there tools that you guys have to kind of learn about how a system is looking population wise um yeah there's a lot of tools it starts with people like max being being the main tool we have field biologists across the state and technicians across the state that are are very good at their jobs they work very hard and have at certain times of the year have to work really long hours out in the field um, so we have standardized protocols that we've set up over the years that are 
kind of organized to survey the how the population is doing, whether it's going up or down, how it compares to other lakes, so that we can get these long-term records and we can compare t from lake to lake. So we have parts of those surveys that are more geared towards assessing panfish populations. Um, some of that is netting kind of in the late spring. Um, we're talking about electrofishing in the fall. So these things would, would give us really good, inf in some cases do, and, and hopefully in the future will give us new information about panfish populations. What we get from that is, is kind of a relative number. So if I go out and I put a fike net in a lake, which is one of our main uh, tools for surveying crappie. Can you, can you, yeah. can you explain a fike net? I'm going yeah. to okay. tell you about a okay. fike net. So if you've ever seen a minnow trap, the ones that have kind of the cones that the fish swim into and they just can't figure out their way out, you know, there's nothing that entangles them or ensnares them. There's no bait or anything. Basically, it's just uh, an angled net where they swim in and they're not quite smart enough to figure out how to get out. Um, that's my best description of a fike net over uh, just an audio format here. I'd love to be able to show you with my hands what I'm doing. He's doing um, a lot, too. You're missing it. There's <laughs> a lot of shapes and movements, but um, we set fike nets out, and they're really good at catching crappies. And every time we pull up a fike net, we count and we measure all those crappies. And what that gives us is an average number per net that we put in the lake. And that changes from year to year, and it changes from lake to lake. And the way we can relate that to the public then is, hey, you know, this year we caught 20 crappie per net. Five years ago, it was 10, so our crappie population seems to be increasing. Good time to go catch some crappies. And we put that all under reports. You can find it on the DNR website. Uh, we have some other tools that we're working on to get that information out to people, and that'll help you find uh, good fishing locations based on what we're seeing in our surveys. So what are, what are you guys measuring when you pull up that net? Is it just the number of fish? Are you looking at length or...? Yeah, number of fish is, is obviously a very common one. We do look at length. Sometimes we look at weight. With certain panfish species, you can look at um, the sex and the sex ratio. Um, you can look at whether they've spawned or not yet. You can look at what they're eating. I mean, we, we tailor the question that we're trying to answer to whatever issues are going on in that lake. So, um, But there's a whole bunch of information we can take from fish. And the other big one we get a lot is age. And you guys, as, as analysts, work with that age data a lot, and that's, that's really informa good information. You can learn a lot from knowing how old the fish are and from a population, knowing kind of how many fish of different ages are in a sample. You can figure out, you know, how fast are they growing? Do you have a lot of really old fish that are really small? It might mean your fish are not growing that well. You can figure out, you know, kind of what their mortality rates are. Is it really high or really low? Can you adjust fishing, for example? So you can, you know, from a few... I, mean, I shouldn't say simple because they take time to do, but from a few measurements like number, length, weight, age, you can glean a lot of information from what that population is doing. And age is actually really interesting because if you're wondering how we get that, you take a piece off the fish. <laughs> sometimes it's a scale or sometimes it's a chunk of their spine, and then we look at it under a microscope and there's rings on there just like the rings on a tree. So, so it's not the number of spots on a crappie is, is the age, huh? That would be really cool. That must be that an old lobster. Yeah. That would save us so much time <laughs> if that was true. Or on a perch or something. <laughs> that, that would be amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, and I think we're going we're gonna to talk about the panfish management plan in a little bit, so I think we'll, we'll table that for now. But just knowing as a listener, kind of as a reminder, we're talking about panfish biology and management. Uh, we've got three DNR fisheries guys here, but just knowing that they're collecting all of this info and it's, it's specific and it's being used for specific things. So they're just working really hard to kind of collect this data and use it in a way that really should be helping you and your time on the water and really creating these experiences for you. So I think that's important perspective to keep as in mind as we keep moving forward here. So another thing about panfish too, you mentioned they can live in all types of places. Um, there'll be a lot in a given lake. So can you guys describe maybe the spawning process? I know even if you're not familiar, you've probably heard about spawning beds and things like that. So can you guys describe the process there? What's the what's like the parental rating for this podcast? I mean, how explicit <laughs> can we be here? We can be uh, just all the nasty fish stuff you want to talk about. Just get into it. It's science, man. Just, get, just do it. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe I'll just start with one of the panfish species because they're all a little different. Um, Perch are really interesting because perch have these big, they're called skeins, and it's a clump of eggs that are all held together by this kind of gelatinous mass. And if it's you're, like a six foot long accordion if you get yeah. that really big fish. It's really interesting. So it's, yeah. yeah. It's amazing to see how much comes out of this little perch mm -hmm. 
and she'll the, the female will kick out this giant long egg mass and they drape it over weeds or over sticks um, and the male fertilizes it obviously that's that's part of the process and then the eggs hatch there so what the perch does is, is totally different than all the other panfish so we'll just get that one out of the way right away they're they're in a different family they have a different spawning strategy but they have this big globule and you can actually see them on the bottom if you're out in the lake in the spring Bluegills? Bluegills? Yeah. Yeah. Bluegills are um, very different, like Max was saying. So bluegills and a lot of the other um, kind of what we think of as sunfish species, so like bluegills, crappie and stuff, they'll actually go up in the spring and the males will clear off like a nest. So you'll kind of, in the spring, a lot of times you'll be able to go kind of along shore and you'll see all these kind of depression, these circular depressions along shore. And a lot of times they'll have fish hovering over them. And then a the male is clearing off this nest Female comes in and lays eggs, the male fertilizes the eggs, and he'll actually guard that nest um, until the fry hatch. So for a lot of the other sunfish, that's kind of how they do it. Um, and so you can do a lot of things in the spring where you find that that's the best time to go out and fish for panfish is when they're on these nests because they're guarding those nests. You can throw something into that nest and they'll pick it up. Aggressive, and, yeah. Exactly, be protecting it. And there's all sorts of fascinating stuff with bluegill. Yeah. I mean, you could, yeah. We could do a whole podcast just on bluegill because mm -hmm. there's these... <laughs> Alternate life histories, we call them. Give me, give me the cliff notes of basically go for spawning. it, Alex. They're basically different strategies for how to get the woman to uh, to like you. So, um, just like people, yeah. Right? So, uh, when these these bigger male bluegills go in and set up nests, they're trying to attract females to the nest. So, if you're bigger and more colorful, those are things that work well for you. Um, so. Then a female comes in, lays the eggs, and the male fertilizes those eggs. There's this alternate strategy which says, I'm not even going to try to be a big male. I'm not going to try to attract the female. I'm going to let that other big male do all the work, and I'm going to sneak in and fertilize the eggs that she lays before the other male can. So those are called sneakers. And these are males that never reach that really large uh, large length that the, that the larger males are that, are that they're achieving. So they tend to reach their biggest size around four or five inches and they they stay that way their whole lives and they kind of hang around the side of these beds and sneak in and fertilize the eggs are you going to tell them why they don't grow anymore why don't they grow anymore max <laughs> well, they put all their energy into sperm production instead of body mass they so have it's really big testes so it's kind of the brains versus brawn argument. Yeah. So like there's it. like a natural selection thing in here somewhere. But and there's also a kind of a cross-dressing aspect to it because those males also don't get the big colors that the big males do. They kind of stay kind of bland looking like females. So they might also be confused as females when they come into the nest too. Wow, that is... Yeah. We told you it was weird. I am <laughs> learning so much about fish spawning right now that I never knew I wanted to know. But thank you. That was very interesting. There are plenty of videos on YouTube of this of a GoPro on a nest and seeing a little sneaker male come on in. So if, well, if you're interested like you need in to that, watch you that can find it. Don't watch yeah. it at work. But. <laughs> <laughs> so are panfish prolific uh, rep reproducers? Then is is it a yearly cycle, or can you guys explain that? It depends. Um, yellow perch are kind of a once a year kind of critter. Um, other like bluegills can spawn multiple times a year and get multiple year classes. It depends on um, how warm the lake is and kind of how long the growing season is versus whether they can pull that off or not. Um, I like the folks from Wisconsin talk a little bit more about whether that happens up here. But up north, they get one shot yeah. typically. But yeah, in the southern part of the state, you'll you'll see them. They'll stay on beds for quite a long time, and they may have a couple a couple different uh, clutches. I think is part of the term, right? Yeah. And what time of year are they spawning? Did you say spring? Yeah, so I, and it varies throughout the state. You know, down south, I'm sure May is probably a big time for bluegill. Yeah, late April into mid-May. Okay, and then up north for us, it's typically late May, June. Uh, it, it all is, is tripped by water temperature for the most part. So when you're talking about bluegill, it's around 70 degrees water temperature ballpark. Um, crappies are more in like the mid-50s. And perch are low to mid-50s, typically. So then what kind of... Um recruitment are they getting do you guys have a good feel for that as far as say x amount of eggs was this may be too hard of a question that we might not even have the info on but so x amount of eggs is laid do you guys have a feel for what percent of those eggs laid end up being recruited in the population that first year or 
super so fish recruitment as a general topic is something i study and it's a super hard question to pin down because if you think about you know you might have whatever how many millions of eggs spawned in a pond or a lake and a tiny change in the percent of that survive from year to year can lead to huge changes you know in how many actual um offspring are produced or a hatch for example so it really depends it depends on um, water temperature. If you get a cold snap when those eggs are laid, they might change, they might slide out, slow down their development. Or if you don't have the right food available when the larvae hatch, it might change. So it's something that it's an important question for us to understand, but it's also a really difficult question to, mm -hmm. to drill down on. So probably pretty safe to say that regardless of the panfish species, 99. It's a maybe 9% of all the eggs that are laid do not end up producing an adult panfish. Yeah, so if you have, you know, however many millions of eggs and 99.99898% die one year and 99.9995% die the next year, that's still a huge change in your actual year class strength, but it's a very, very small fraction, and what's driving that small fraction that survive is, is the tricky part. And it's, it's got to be localized with lakes, too, based on effects that happen. Is, is predation a factor there, too? Definitely. Everything likes eating panfish. Yep. Um, and even for adult panfish, mortality can be really high. And so mortality is our fisheries term for, you know, the percentage that die every year. Um, and there's a natural component of that. You know, they're not immortal. They die of old age. There's diseases. They get eaten by something else. They hit their head on a dock really hard. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then there's, there's fishing mortality, which is how many people take home and eat. But like, it's not uncommon in a panfish population for 30 to 50% of all the adults to die in a given year. So mentioning the die of old age part, how fast do panfish grow? And, and do we have a, a feel for kind of the, how long that they live in a, in a vacuum? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, well, we're going to give you another like amorphous fish <laughs> biologist answer <laughs> here, which is, it depends. It depends. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> but, a rule of thumb that I use up north quite a bit, where our growth is slower, it's faster in the southern part of the state, but up north, it's about an inch a year. That's what you get. So if you're looking at a 10-inch bluegill, it probably took about 10 years for that fish to get to that size. And that seems to hold up fairly well for perch, um, crappies a little bit faster, maybe eight years to get to 10 inches. So you mentioned slower up north than in the south. Is there a reason for that? Is it water temp or? Yeah, it's primarily water temperature. They most of our panfish are warm water species. Yellow perch is a cool water species. So all that means is sort of what temperature do they grow most efficiently at. So warm water species tend to grow really fast in the south. There's also lots of, these are pretty productive lakes. There's lots, lots of prey for them to eat. So it's a combination of having a lot to eat and having optimal water temperatures to grow really fast during the summers at least. They tend to put on a lot of weight during the summer and then kind of stop growing through the winter. Then continue growing the next summer. That's really interesting because as an outsider looking in who knows very little about panfish biology, I would have just assumed that they grow a lot faster than that. Because when you're thinking about mm -hmm. the age class and all that and you, you get a nice size bluegill, you're talking like over a decade old. In parts it, of the state, yeah. Yeah, it's less so in the south. They can get to that size, you know, in a few years, three or four or five years maybe, um, depending on the lake and the temperature of that lake and what prey they have mm -hmm. and all those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, where, where there is warm water, they can hit those, those nice kind of trophy sizes a little bit faster, but it's not like it's a one or two year thing. It's still, they have to have made it through the gauntlet of not dying of all these other things that Max was talking about, not getting harvested in order to reach those sizes. And that's actually one of the, one of the messages that we've been trying to get out to anglers is a, a really high quality panfish takes a lot of time investment and we have to have the right conditions to get there. They're not like weeds, you know, they don't just pop up magically. So it takes, it takes a lot of specific management to get those fish there and, and anglers, you know, play a role in that too. So you mentioned prey earlier, Alex. So what do panfish like to eat? Are they more generalist or are they picky? They are generalists, um, and it'll vary. Again, the scientist answer it depends on you know God, what species. I can't, I can't which get a straight these... answer out of these guys. <laughs> well, it's, this, it's the panfish problem of dealing or lumping these multiple groups of, of fish into into one. So, perch are going to eat something different than than your standard bluegill, um, but they are omnivorous. They'll eat bugs that are on on the floor of the the lake, on the in the substrate, in the rocks, in the sand, in the weeds. 
Um, they'll eat small crayfish, they'll eat really small fish. When they're really young, in their first year or two of life, they'll eat zooplankton that are swimming around. Um, perch that are kind of living offshore, they'll eat zooplankton and smaller fish. Um, you guys have anything to add? I mean, that's, they eat everything if it's small enough for them to eat it, basically. If it fits in their mouth, they'll, they'll try and eat it. And I think that's right. And it's really kind of uh, through their life things. Like Alex said, early in life, it's zooplankton, and they'll kind of switch to um, insects. And then as they get big enough to start eating fish, they'll, they'll start to eat fish. Including, but, including their own kind. They will cannibalize, absolutely. too. Mm-hmm. So there's no, yeah, there's no honor among thieves, though. A, little, a big crappie lead a little crappie. It happens all the time. I think you know someone. <laughs> so the, I don't know if you guys can answer this one or not, but you always hear from people to go back to the fish fry thing. It's like, well, I prefer bluegill over perch, or I prefer crappie over all of it. Is Does their diet affect how they taste? Because I think anyone that you would ask would probably say that they taste a bit different. Maybe some might be milder than others. So do you guys, do you guys know if that may affect that? This that sounds like Zach's next research project. It's a very interesting question. I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I think I'll send in my resume. You yeah, can. sounds good. Yeah, I'll bring you in. We can, you know, do some uh, hook will, and line sampling. I'll maybe. test the fish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a scientist. <laughs> So I, I'm sorry, I'm just giving you guys tough questions, but that's that's always something I've wondered. But it's interesting just because it sounds like they eat such a wide range of things that it may not be the case. But I guess we just don't know. You know, you hear about a lot of a lot of anglers, and I don't know how much truth there is to this or not. But you know, different times of the year that the the fillet quality will be better. You know, people tend to say if it comes out of cold water, it's going to be better quality than if it's caught out of warm water. Um, my personal experience is if you deep fry it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but if you're doing something a little more, you know, cuisine, maybe it does matter. Yeah. So I think the different species definitely yeah, tastes different. Definitely. But Absolutely. I don't know if you, if you caught a bluegill out of Mendota and you caught a bluegill out of somewhere up north, I'm not sure that I would be able to tell the difference, especially mm-hmm. after the deep fryer. But um, <laughs> We're going to have to try. We're going to yeah. have to test this. That's sounds all like this plan. means. So I'll, I'll get that on, set up. On the next case. podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a good blind taste test. Yeah, actually. right. So on the other side of the prey question, so what is a panfish's main predators? Once again, panfish, super general. Um, obviously, it might be different for the subspecies. but So what is eating panfish in a given body of water? Again, it's kind of whatever, so a panfish will eat whatever it can fit in its mouth, and if a panfish can fit in something's mouth, they might try to eat it, provided that they kind of use the same habitat. Um, I'd say the main predator is probably humans. We consume a lot of panfish. Um, but within the lake, uh, certainly anything bigger, so a lot of largemouth bass will eat small, small panfish. Um, your walleye, northern pike, and muskie are all going to be eating perch. Um, that being said, I think all of our panfish tend to have pretty strong spines on their dorsal fins, the fin on top, and their pectoral fins, the fins that are kind of defense right below mechanism. their gills. And yeah, those provide a pretty good defense mechanism. So they tend not to be the preferred prey of most of those predator species. Um, if there's a lot of them and they're sharing the habitat with the predator, yeah, they're going to get eaten. But they're not as easy to eat as a, a shiner or a sucker or something that's more soft-bodied and a little bit more mm-hmm. easy for a predator to take down. So something we see with wildlife species too is that predation can really be a good thing for an ecosystem. So can you guys talk about maybe why predation could be a positive for some of these systems or, or is that the case? Yeah, that's that's huge for me as, as a manager and trying to deliver you know high quality pan fishing opportunities is you have to have a really abundant predator population to keep that panfish recruitment in check, which I talked about earlier. You don't want them just reproducing like crazy and filling the lake with millions and millions and millions of little panfish. You want a predator that's keeping that clamp down so that you're just having a few of those panfish get through and when you have a lower density they're going to grow faster and get to that bigger size. So it's not at all a coincidence that many of our best walleye lakes in northern Wisconsin are also the lakes that are going to have the biggest crappie, the biggest bluegill, the biggest perch. So that's definitely a management strategy. And the trick there is you have to find a balance. If you want to have a lot of predators in the lake, that means you have to make sure that they're, they're not getting overharvested either. And people really like eating walleye, too. I don't know if you knew that, Sawyer. Have you ever heard that? I, 
One or two people have, yeah. have mentioned that in passing to me. but Yeah, so it's, whether it's walleye or bass or any of the other, other predators, it's actually a strategy to, you know, keep more predators out there, which means, you know, anglers can't take as many home to deliver better pan fishing. So there's, there's definitely some trade-offs in the management there. So kind of staying in that vein of keeping your manager hat on, does Wisconsin have a pan fish management plan other than like the survey work, which as I understand it feeds up into kind of a larger strategy? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. We do, um, although we spent a long time not having one. Panfish, <laughs> for the longest time in this state, were super important to everybody. Everybody loved catching them, you know, everybody harvested them, all this stuff, but we never actually had a plan that said, you know, what's our strategy here? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to deliver for people? So. Uh, over the last five years, basically, we've been going through the process of developing a plan. We had a lot of sessions where we sat down with anglers and, you know, asked a lot of the questions that are on this podcast. What do you value about panfish? What kind of experiences do you want to have? Um, we should have been asking which ones taste the best. Apparently, we missed that. But we fed all that into a panfish management plan that, that's out there as a document. Um, it's on the DNR website. If you're an angler, you can look at it, it might be kind of dry, um, but the real value is to all our biologists around the state. It says, okay, here's the best thing that you guys can be doing to make habitat better for panfish. If you need to stock panfish, which we do in some places, here's the strategy for doing that. It incorporates that predator stuff that I was just talking about a moment ago. So we do have this kind of guidance document that brings it all together and, and puts more of a statewide focus on, on delivering more panfish quality. And, and anglers have been asking for that for, for a while. It's, it's such a popular fish. We, we should have had this plan sooner, but we're happy to have it now and we're moving forward on trying to knock off some of the things that are in that plan. So not to go too far off the rails here, but something I usually like to ask the biologists that we have on is maybe just briefly describe the intersection of social and science. So working with the public and what they may want and kind of finding that intersection with what science tells us. So can you guys talk about kind of how we juggle those things and, and maybe it's in the panfish management plan with some of the questions that we ask, but can you guys maybe talk about that a little bit? I can touch on it broadly. Um, it's becoming more and more important um, for us as an agency to, to engage our stakeholders. They're our customers, they buy licenses, they pay taxes in the state. Um, so we want to make sure that the resources that we're trying to provide for them are the resources that they actually want, that they have the opportunity to use them as they want. So we are making these efforts, whether it's managing trout or muskie or panfish, we're trying to engage with these, these anglers and, and decide you know, or ask them the questions that Max was just talking about. What do you want out of this fishery? Which direction do you want to take? Do you want us to take it in? And then our job is to figure out how to get there. So we do that through research. We do that through our monitoring, and um, have to come up with strategies that sort of link the objectives that we want to meet for our for our customers, for the public, um, with the best information that we have available. So. One of the examples that I use for that is, you know, ma marrying the biology with the social desires that people have. And so if we had a lake in northern Wisconsin, and there's a bunch of people that lived on it, and they all went to Florida on vacation and caught tarpon, and they thought tarpon were just the coolest thing ever. And they came back from vacation and came to my office and said, we want to manage this lake for tarpon. Well, that's definitely not in line with the biology of that lake. I mean, it's not salt water for starters. We'll just we'll just end it right there. So that's kind of an extreme example of the, where the public might want something that the lake can't deliver. And then there's the other side of things, which is the lake might be able to deliver something that the public doesn't want. And the, what I would say there is I'm a fish nerd, so I'm really into bowfin or dogfish. I like catching them. And I can recognize a lake that has great dogfish habitat. And I could manage for that, but the public doesn't really want me to. So <laughs> there aren't a lot of bowfish fan, bowfin fans out there. So we got to find these management goals where the biology and the social desires intersect. And, and certainly that's pretty easy with panfish because everybody wants them. So then it just becomes more of a question of how do we deliver on, on good size and what sorts of trade-offs do we have to ask anglers to make. And a lot of times that means we're going to have to have a lower bag limit so that we can give the fish a little more time to, to get bigger and things like that. So that's where a lot of the biology comes in with panfish is, is regulations. And then the other constraint, so one constraint on what we can do is the biology, can a lake deliver it? But there's also legal and ethical constraints. So 
invasive species, the tarpon example, we couldn't bring in a fish from out of state if it's not native to this area because there are regulations and laws that say we can't. So there are lots of other things that kind of come into play. And those are all, those are all within that social science world, um, but they're not necessarily coming from, from the customers, from the, from the anglers. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of managing expectations and finding where that meets with what you guys are learning day to day doing the surveys and, and learning all these things. So I think that's really interesting for people to hear. So I think you hear people that, that may feel that their voice isn't being heard or things like that, but there are so many opportunities for public feedback, all these management plans and things like that. Um, you can give the biologists a call. They're always happy to talk to you. So I just wanted to touch on that briefly. But Max, something you mentioned with the habitat management plan was kind of giving giving the county biologists and, and the folks in the office a roadmap for what they can do to manage the species. So obviously that can include habitat. So can you guys maybe talk about what kind of habitats panfish need, maybe even by season? Once again, Ooh. super general. Yeah. Um, but maybe maybe we pick one species. Why don't we pick bluegill? Yeah. Well, well that, may, that, that, that might make it easier. Yeah. Or, or harder. Easy one. Bluegill, no, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, the habitat conversation is so interesting. And, you know, for, for quite a long time, the focus within DNR and what we were working on with all our partners was fish cribs. Fish cribs. We're going to put fish cribs out there. And fish cribs are kind of cool. They have a purpose. Um, in my eyes, as, as a biologist, their, their biggest purpose is attracting fish and creating a good spot to go fishing. But it doesn't necessarily fill a critical need for the fish's habitat. Um, typically what we see for bluegill... And most of our panfish species is weeds, wood, those are the two big ones. If there's wood in the water on the shoreline, perch spawn on it, young panfish like, like bluegill and crappies will spend time in them. Um, aquatic plants are really big and we've seen situations where if you lose all the aquatic plants that can be really hard on, on panfish. So uh, those are the two biggest ones from my perspective. So is that a concealment thing then do you think as far as why they kind of gravitate towards those areas? Uh, it, it's different things at different times. So a lot of it is substrate to, a, to lay eggs on. Um, so that's very early life history. But then once you have fish that are hatched or, or growing, then yeah, it's basically concealment from predators. And that's going to determine how many are going to make it to adulthood, how many are going to recruit to be adults. And food. There's food on the plants. They, they'll pick little bugs off the wood, things like that. So there's a food source for them that's kind of built into that habitat. And is, is that kind of a year-round thing? So, for example, hard water, um, it's iced over. Are they still going to kind of gravitate towards those areas, or do they tend to move to more open water? Or Well, you certainly can have that. Uh, if you can find deep weeds in a lake, that's pretty much a good bet for fish almost year-round. Um, so if you're, out, you know, if you're an angler, that's, that's what you should be looking for. Um, but so, so when you say deep weeds, can you explain that a little more? Sure, yeah. So, you know, weeds grow really thick in the shallows, but when you're talking about winter, that area is under ice or there's not very much water there, so you got to have a little more depth for those fish. So I would say for panfish, three or four feet is kind of the minimum water depth underneath the ice. And then if, the, if you keep going out deeper and you continue to find weeds, you'll probably continue to find fish there. But the other thing we see a lot in the winter, and this is super common with perch, is they like these big mud flats. And they just roam around in these mud flats because there's bugs down in the mud, and that's what they're looking for. So mud is kind of a habitat too, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it holds the food. And I think the important thing to think about habitat when you think about um, lakes and people that go in and want to you know, spray mm -hmm. to kill weeds or they want to pull out any tree that falls into the lake, like that's habitat. And a lot of times if you remove that habitat, you don't have anywhere for those little fish to hide from predators. You don't have as much food production for those little fish and you can be really hard on your panfish population. So sometimes adding in or leaving those trees that fall in or letting those pl some places of the vegetation grow in can be really beneficial for your fish populations. Really good example of aesthetics not necessarily being for the best if you live on a lake or something like that. Think of the fish. My God, think of the fish. Yeah, or, or reframe your aesthetic of, you know, what is beautiful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the wild shoreline is, is, is pretty nice looking once you kind of get used to it and know that that's serving an important ecological function. Yep. Just imagine what's under the water, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So obviously, tons of, tons of bodies of water in the state, so you guys can't be everywhere, but are there ways 
you mentioned kind of the habitat that they prefer. Are there ways that uh, DNR staff and often volunteers can kind of tweak habitat and create habitat for fish? You mentioned the cribs briefly, but are there other things that you guys are doing on the landscape? Yeah, one of the other big ones that we've started pushing lately is, is restoring that shoreline wood. So uh, we call them fish sticks commonly. Sometimes you hear them called tree drops. And basically what we're doing is we're artificially putting more wood into the water just like if the tree had fallen in naturally. And sometimes that means bringing a tree in from somewhere else like a county forest. Sometimes we are dropping them right off the shoreline, but that addresses a, a habitat that is really deficient in a lot of our lakes. So that's been a big push. And then uh, obviously with aquatic plants, there's so many issues with invasive species and things like that. Uh, we're just trying to keep uh, panfish in the conversation as we're trying to manage aquatic plants and make sure they have the plants they need for, for their life cycles as well. Mm -hmm. And something we talked about briefly earlier was that kind of you guys sharing that humans are often uh, the biggest predators of panfish. So how does harvest affect the quality of maybe a panfish system, say in a given body of water? Well, it does quite a bit. Um, we're learning more and more about this. This is an, you know, prevailing wisdom. Um, Max kind of talked about this this paradigm where a little bit of harvest can help because it can reduce the the population a little bit, and you can have better growth. With panfish, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, because they're a harvest oriented fishery, we tend to, and they're pretty small fish. We're talking about people tend to harvest a lot of them, and they tend to harvest the biggest ones. And what we're finding is that harvesting only the big fish in a system might not actually be all that great for the population. And that, ha that gets back to the, the basically the genetics of the population. So there's some fish that have the genes that are going to allow them to grow really fast and achieve those large sizes. Um, when we harvest all of those fish, we're left with ge the genetics that kind of say it makes more sense to grow more slowly and not, not reach those high sizes. So... Sometimes in panfish populations, if we have a lot of small bluegills in a lake, it's not just because they're stunted or there's too many. It might be that we just don't have those large growing, fast growing, large individuals anymore. So there can be benefits to reducing harvest in some systems. So reducing harvest, do we have any tools in the toolbox? So probably regulations is the clear one. So do we use regulations then to kind of control how that all works? Yeah, reg regulations are definitely the most direct tool, and they are one we use pretty often. You know, there's thousands of lakes in Wisconsin that, that we're managing. Um, there are only a little over 200 that have a more restrictive panfish limit than kind of our general statewide limit, which is 25 per day. So uh, we do this in some places. A majority of waters still have that statewide limit. So we're kind of working on, on developing limits that anglers will accept, that they like, they, they think it's a good thing for the lake, that are going to deliver a higher quality panfish population. So we have kind of an ongoing project looking at that. But uh, the other thing we do is, is just educating people, and this podcast is kind of a way to do that, and we have other tools too. But we, we let people know that, you know, they're not weeds. You can't just harvest them at free will forever and expect to continue to have big panfish out there in the lake. So um, a lot of it's just changing people's perceptions. Can you guys talk about, is there anything new maybe we're working on, on the regulation side of things, anything new that we're testing out to maybe learn more and learn how we can better kind of use that tool? Yeah, we have a project that's going on throughout the state where we took about 100 lakes. Uh, we worked with anglers to select these lakes too. That's an important thing to mention. This wasn't just the DNR imposing our will. We, we went to anglers and said, hey, where are panfish not doing very well where we think they could be doing better? We came up with these 100 lakes. We put lower bag limits on them, and we're monitoring that to see if it um, delivers uh, increases in size, which is kind of our expectation. So um, that project started in 2016, and we're going to be doing our first evaluation in a couple of years. And what we learned from that is going to kind of set the tone for what we want to do in the rest of the state. And again, we'll continue to work with anglers and the Conservation Congress and all our partners on that and say, hey, you know, look, when we lower the bag limit on these lakes, this is the result we got. Do you want to do this other places? Do you want to, you know, continue to take kind of a hands-off approach with panfish? We're going to we're gonna really take our lead from the anglers on this, but uh, we are doing some kind of proactive things to, to better understand regulations and their effect on panfish. 
So that's going to be an interesting one for people to, to keep an eye on and just another kind of example of how you can get involved and kind of help um, steer the boat, pun intended, um, <laughs> kind of in the future of Wisconsin's fisheries. God, that was lame. I already, I already regret saying that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's on the permanent record now. <laughs> yeah. So we have covered a lot. I think this has been an excellent conversation. I think the mix of your guys' duties and backgrounds has really lent itself well to what we covered so one thing I like to do before we wrap up, is there the kind of the one thing, is there one thing you could tell someone either about the work that you're doing or panfish in Wisconsin? Um, maybe you get one opportunity, you got them in the elevator. What would you tell them? Oh, I get to go first? Okay. Uh, I think I would just like to put out a promo for panfish. I think they're one of my favorite things to fish for. And I think there are a lot of ways where we're trying to improve their quality. I'm fairly new to the DNR, so I'm really impressed with the work that these guys have been doing. I'm excited to keep working with them um, on what they're uh, trying to do to improve panfish. But you know what? They're accessible. They're delicious. I think you should get out there, get involved, you know, catch a few and see what you think. Well said. I'll kind of add on to the same thing. Um, you know, Zach started off this whole podcast by saying he got into fishing via panfish. That was the first thing he did. And I think it's really important for us as a state to have engaged anglers, people who are love to fish. Um, that's a huge part of our culture. Panfish are the way to do that. You know, take your kids out, find, find a Saturday afternoon and a couple small rods and some bobbers. Kids will love it. It's great. So use the panfish. There's a ton of them out there. and Get the kids involved. Yeah, I think that's that's awesome, and I, I would echo that. You know, we ask a lot of panfish, from being the first fish we catch to being the most abundant fish that's harvested in the state by far. Like it's not even close. There's way more panfish harvested, and that's great. And we can continue to, you know, have that resource. It's a sustainable thing. Uh, but we also want to ask people to kind of, you know, learn about panfish. Thanks for listening to the podcast and, and reframe how you think about them because we think panfishing can only continue getting better in Wisconsin as, as people understand more about these fish and as we in the DNR, you know, research and learn more about them. So, um, yeah, go panfish. Now I regret saying that, sir. Do we each get a mulligan? Uh, no, unfortunately not. I guess the only thing I would add is, um, as a member of the, I'm going to put my general public hat on for a second and just I don't know why this is, but my assumption, it just seems, would be panfish, in my mind and in other people's minds, it seems are just so common that it seems like something that isn't even, hardly even managed. You kind of think of it almost like a squirrel, like nothing against squirrels, but you just see squirrels all the time. So it's really interesting to hear from you guys that all this management and all this work is going into the species, because you don't think about that a lot of the time when you're catching panfish or going fishing and things like that. So that's interesting from my from my end of things. But does anyone have any closing thoughts before we wrap up? We have covered a lot. Yeah, we have. We appreciate the opportunity. You know, Panfish Team is going to be here. We're going to continue to work on some of these questions with some of these bright researchers, and, and we'll try and push some of the interesting results out to people because, you know, we find that despite everybody seeing panfish, just like the squirrels in their lawn, um, a lot of people don't understand a lot about them. I'm guessing most of the listeners didn't know about uh, Sneaker Bluegill until Alex brought that into their life. Um, so the, the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, keep, keep learning, keep enjoying the outdoors. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, this was a great one. I look forward to doing more with these guys. So as a reminder, you can find this podcast and all the other episodes um, at dnr.wi.gov keywords Wild Wisconsin or on our YouTube channel WIDNR TV or our iTunes or Stitcher channels you can search Wild Wisconsin off the record that is a mouthful um, and remember to check out our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter pages we mentioned how accessible pan fishing is we want to see your pictures we want to hear your stories we want to see your videos so please share them with us you can find all of our social media pages at keyword connect so other than that thanks for listening to another episode of the wild wisconsin off the record podcast and we will see you next time